<laughs> Just that that's old school right there. That's that's the old school camera. How how about um how about uh, the Polaroid? Anybody remember the old Polaroid? Right? You Hey, look at these, everybody who, is, who thought they were young. Yo, I'm a young adult. No, you're not young anymore if you remember a Polaroid. You're old with the rest of us, right? That square thing that would come out and be like a, look like a slice of American cheese, and you'd have the picture on there. That's that Polaroid right there. Yeah, well, let me tell you, let me see if you're old school, because, see, really what it is, is, is if you're old school, but if you can stay relevant, you can be a leader in this generation, Right? And you can direct the future of this generation. But let me see my old school people. How many people can finish this sentence? If I were to say, now, fill it to the rim with, oh, man. Fill it to the rim with brim. How about, the best part of waking up is? Ah, <laughs> there you guys are. Now, you got to go way back for this one now. How about this one? Oh, what a feeling to drive. Ah, who said that? Oh, I should give him a box of candy. Yeah, that's old school right there. Here's one that used to come on the TV when I was a boy, you know, watching something on TV, a, a show or whatever, and all of a sudden this creepy commercial would come on, and it'd be some crickets in the background, and it'd be like an empty park that's dark. It's 7 p.m. Do you know where your children are? Right? Remember that commercial? That was so creepy. You'd be sitting there like, oh, my God. I'm all you can think is, thank God I'm at the house. Thank God I'm home, right? I mean, they would scare the daylights out of you. I'd already be in my pajamas. 6.30, the sun's out, the kids are out on the street. I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the house, right? You better be in the house before the street lights came on back in the day, right? Because you know that was a whooping right there. <laughs> I, you know if you're old school is when you used to get whoopings. Now, I've spent half my life uh, up north and half my life down south. So I'm kind of on the border of that old school. Let me tell you, if you're old school, you used to get a paddling at school, right? Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah, everybody who's old school knows about that. Let me tell you, because you know, there's a lot of people claiming to be old school, and they're really not, right? This is how you know for certain if you are old school or not, okay? Never mind the age. If you have never had to go out to a tree to pick a switch, for a whooping, you ain't old school. <laughs> yes, indeed. But let me tell you something. Because of the generation that we live in, if you, you, you who are old school, you who are new school, right, you, you are on the very, very border. You're on, you're on the, the, the crossroads of a generation that is emerging and a generation that is passing the baton on its way out, right? Now, you're not retiring anytime soon, but, but you, you know that, that you're not taking the selfies in the bathroom. You know what I mean? If anything, you're going to post a nice family portrait, but you're still technolo technologically somewhat savvy, right? So my, well, my daughter will say, if, uh, if you're there, she'll be like, oh, yeah, you're pretty electronic-y. You know, if I have a problem with my phone, I don't go to the Apple store. I give it to my daughter. And she will have the thing set up for you. Okay, I updated it for you. And let me show you this emoji. Oh, look at this emoji right here. We just got the brand new. Look at the nerd emoji. You know, and, and she knows how to do that stuff. Those young kids, they're wired for, to do that kind of stuff, right? So there's no need of me being 130 trying to run the media department because I'm the boss, right? <laughs> because I don't know what to do. So we, we sit on the very edge of what God is doing, right? And we need to be like the sons of Issachar in the scriptures of 1 Chronicles 12.32. They were men of Israel who understood their times and knew what Israel should do. And the Bible says that all their brothers followed them. 1 Chronicles 12.32. That's not even my passage of scripture. That's just a little nugget for the side there. Just, just write that down and do a little research on those guys. Men of Israel who understood their time and knew what Israel should do. In other words, they had leaders that were up and coming. And because they stayed relevant and had an understanding of their culture, they were able to advise the next generation coming. That's important. The key to staying like a son of Issachar is to stay relevant, right? Because believe it or not, times have changed. Can anybody say amen? Times 
have changed, okay? In our culture, we have become, in these days, very, very self-conscious, very, very self-focused, and, and, and very self-centered, right? And, and in 1 Timothy, the scriptures talk about that in 1 Timothy 3, that, that this is the way it would be. But as Christians, we're called to live in this culture, like we've been preaching all week long, to be a catalyst, to be willing to move rock, to be, to be salt, to be light. And sometimes what can happen, though, is we can become so focused, right, when it comes to wanting to highlight the good things in our lives, you know, with, with our selfies, as, as, as we're doing, that, that we want people to see that we can often fail to to neglect and deal with the stuff that we don't want people to see. Now listen, when it comes to leadership of any kind, your character is everything. Your character qualifies you to be able to speak into the lives of people. Character qualifies you. In fact, it is the character that is the foundation that sustains. Now, I'm not even going to try. I would stand up on here and say this is, you know, the illustration of the character. And, you know, we're standing upon that platform, and it's our character that sustains us. But, you know, the rocks fell down just a second ago. And one time I was watching funny home videos, and a pastor got up on the pew and wanted to do an illustration. He said, just as sure as I'm standing on this, this pew, this pulpit here, or what the, the pew, and, and, and as soon as he said that, he went backwards, and he fell down, and he almost killed himself. <laughs> it was pretty funny. But anyway, that's why I was on Funny Home Videos. So I'm not going to be that man, right? But, but listen, our character is the foundation. Of course, our life in Christ is a foundation, but this is what gives us the platform to be able to speak into other people's lives. And we have to be willing to deal with the stuff that we don't want people to see, right? Can I get an Amen. All right, let me get one more amen. amen. Yes, thank you. And, and one more on credit. Amen. Okay, okay, okay. Right. How many people have ever taken a selfie, though? Have you ever taken that picture that you just did not want anybody to see? Right? You take the picture, and your first response, oh, let me see that. Uh, delete that. Yeah, that's not going anywhere. And you can be that husband that says, oh, no, 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 this is going up. And she's like, now, listen, if you ever want to have a home-cooked meal ever again in all of your life, you will delete that, right? <laughs> because we don't want people seeing that stuff. I mean, if we have good sense, right? There's a thing that they got going on now with, uh, what, no filter? Hashtag all, no, hashtag all natural? You know, ha every now and then, now, it's okay to use the filter, though. You know what I mean? You're looking at it, you're like, all natural, like, oh, uh, yeah, about that. Uh, you know, <laughs> but, but there's some things that we just, we don't want people to see. And so the purpose of the selfie is to highlight our very best moments and to draw our attention to ourselves, which is, you know, hence hashtag selfie. And with social media, you know, we're able to do that. We're able, you know, sometimes it's a good thing. Often it's a good thing. My father, uh, my, my, my stepdad had a heart attack once, and um, this was a couple of years ago, within like 15 minutes my, my mom contacted my wife. She was able to post that on Facebook. We had hundreds of people in different countries praying on the spot. So it can be a useful tool, right? It could be a very, very useful tool. Or, you know, maybe you want to share your life with people that you, you, you just, you know, they're not living around you anymore, and it's hard to get down to see family. At least they can, you can literally watch somebody's life nowadays, and from their children going all the way from the beginning all the way, you know, up to teenagers these days by just going on somebody's Facebook page. And you can see how old you are by, you know, how much progress, never mind, how much progress you've made in life, right? But here's another thing that we like to focus in on our culture, and I think the Bible deals with this. If we're going to really be a catalyst and a true leader and have a godly character, we need to deal with this because there's one thing that we really do focus on in our culture, and that is other people's flaws. Other people's flaws. There was a wise man who said, listen, before you try to take the speck out of your brother's eye, remove the enchanted forest from your own. <laughs> right? And sometimes we focus on other people's flaws. And because of social media, the whole world has the opportunity to experience flaws. 
Sometimes they have the opportunity to experience your drama and other people's drama, right? Have you ever have those friends that just post everything about themselves? I mean, they just post everything. You know, you just know every single thing. They, you, they, they just blew their nose over there, and then they, and they just threw something in the garbage, and the dog just went potty. And, I mean, they just put every. And, you know, there's a scripture that, um, that, that is in Proverbs 29, 11, and I don't know if it's for this generation or not. I'm just saying. You know, that's just one of those I'm just saying. But Proverbs 29, 11 says, The fool uttereth all his mind. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you know, that's like a, that's when you say I'm just saying, that means you can say anything and, and it's like saying no offense or something and I'm okay. So we're all right, right? But I'm just saying, but you know, sometimes you can spend five minutes on somebody's social networking site and, and man, you know everything about them. Have you ever seen those arguments on there between like the husband and the wife? Oh, those are the best. You know, you see something on there and it's like, you know. Wish I had some support, he writes. And you're thinking, yeah, I wonder what that meant, right? A little time goes by, and then you see what that meant, because she's like, well, if I could just get somebody to take out the garbage, I'd give them some support, right? He comes back, well, if you would just cook some dinner, hashtag put in work, hashtag others first, you know, hashtag the head of the house. Right, hashtag the button. No. <laughs> right, so the wife's like, "Well, I'd cook some dinner if you would do some dishes." And you know, and it just keeps on going and going and going. Right? Have you ever seen the conversation where somebody puts something up and then somebody comments and they read it wrong? Oh my! Especially in church, it's real bad. Then true colors just start coming out. Right? And they're like, "I can't believe that's messed up." And this, and then finally, you know, like the next day, oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Okay, never mind. You know. <laughs> <laughs> or you have a falling out over social media. Somebody texted you something, and the autocorrect said something different. And now you have gotten into an argument, right? Listen, here is just a nugget on the side for young people coming up. I'm talking with them, right? We're just talking. Do you get on the phone and speak to them, right? Right? Or, or are you just texting when you talk? Because there is a big issue there. One day when you get married, you're actually going to have to sit down and speak to one another without a cell phone. I'm telling you, it is important. You get girls, you've been going out with the guy for a year, barely even know him, don't even know his middle name, right? And it's like, he, I, don't, I just don't know what happened, Pastor. He was an, a, a wonderful texter. He would text the sweetest things, and then when I get in front of him, he doesn't speak. It's like, well, that's because you never really were talking, right? You were texting, and there's a difference between texting and talking, so make sure that you can communicate with one another. Now, that's just, that'll save you some heartache, all right? So, so make sure that we communicate with one another. Oh, my goodness. I, anyway, sometimes we have the tendency to focus upon one another's flaws. And even in church, even in church, you can see that, right? Christians, they have the gift of discernment. I have the gift of discernment, which means I'm going to point out every flaw in you that there is. Never mind what's in my eye. I'm talking about what's in your eye. The Lord has showed me, right? I got a pathetic word, a pro prophetic word. The Lord, right? But you know what? The gift of discernment is the ability to discern, yeah, that which is evil, yes, but that which is good, right? It's able to discern that which is good as well. And sometimes in church, you boy, I tell you what, man, we can point out some flaws in other people. In fact, take a look at sometimes how churches just go out one another. Take a look at this for me real quick. Let me see that first one if I could back there, Joseph. The church marquee. Now look at this right here. Now, Our Lady of Martyrs has posted something, and perhaps they're doing the series, but they just wanted to put on there to advertise, maybe all dogs go to heaven. Right? There was a cartoon, cute little cartoon, but now the Beulah Presbyterian Church had issue with that. Right? So they said only humans go to heaven. Read the Bible. 
You know, the Catholic Church isn't going to let that ride. So they're going to come over here. Let's see what they have to say in reply to it in response. God loves all his creations, dogs included. Well, so a Beulah Presbyterian is going to come back at him and say, dogs don't have souls, and this is not open for debate. You know, somebody comes out there and changes that. It's, this is not digital. They got the lady that comes and fools around with the ladder, you know. But you know, the Catholics aren't going to let that go. So Catholic dogs go to heaven. Presbyterian dogs can talk to their pastor. So come on, Cletus. Come on. I got more where that came from. I will step out of this Christianity right now, and God will, you know. So look at this next one, though. Converting to Catholicism does not magically grant your dog a soul. Now, they went to the scriptures on that one. Beulah wasn't having it. I don't think there's any more after that, is there? Oh, man. Okay, that's, that's it. That's it. I'm going to say they didn't go back at it for another round, did they? Yeah. You know, sometimes, sometimes we can focus in on others instead of focusing in on ourselves. But, but let me take you back, back in the day real quick, back in the day to um, uh, when you guys were in high school or in middle school and you lear learned about um, Archimedes' principle. You remember Archimedes' principle? Right? Remember that one? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> I don't remember it either. I had a, um, a pastor by the name of Andy Stanley highlighted this, and I heard it, and I wanted to, to use it. But uh, Archimedes, for, for everybody who does not remember, he was, um, he was the fellow who explained many, many years ago why, why rocks sink and battleships float. All right? Now, this is really not too important unless you're going swimming, right? But uh, he, he explained he didn't invent this formula. He simply discovered this formula and put it in a mathematical formula, right? Now, before Archimedes, rocks had been sinking, battleships had been floating for a really, really long time. But what he did is he explained why you could throw a pebble in the water and it would sink, and then you could have a several thousand pound battleship and put it out in the water and it would float. And so he recognized that there was a... Uh, um, a relationship between buoyancy and gravity is what he did, right? So let me read what he discovered, and, and then this is going to tie into a scripture, and that's this. He discovered that a weight can be supported in a liquid if the weight of the object was counterbalanced by the displacement of the water of the object. You guys writing that down? Because there's going to be a test on this. You ever had the uh, professor or the, the teacher do that to you? Sometimes when you get like that and you just don't know, they, they call it playing the game. You just nod at the man every now and then. Go right back to sleep. <laughs> Make eye uh, contact every so often. And this principle is interesting because it explains why someone uh, who cannot swim sinks, but when someone throws a life device into the water, it floats. Now, now this is Archimedes, okay? Now, this principle just is, okay? This principle just is. Now, he didn't discover it. It's just a principle that God has set in motion, and it just exists. And we can choose to go along with it and, and reap the benefits of it, or we can choose to ignore it, and we can face the consequences, right? And you can't defy Archimedes' principle. It just is. I remember one time my, my wife, she tried to defy Archimedes' principle. We were at a summer camp, and I had a boy um, named... Marcel, he was in my small group. Now, Marcel, he, he was from the hood, and he couldn't swim. And he told me there's no pools in the hood, he told me. I said, okay. So my wife, though, we were just dating at the time, she decided that she was going to have Marcel swim in the little pond, right? So we had this little slide, and it's at summer camp, and all the kids are in their bathing suits. Everybody's having fun. So, so he's on the slide, and she's saying, Marcel, come down the slide. And he's like, I don't want to. I can't swim. Oh, come on. Come on. I can't swim. Come on. I'll catch you. So he's like, all right. 
He goes from the top. He slides down. As soon as his toes touch the water, he panics. He's just flipping out. Ah! 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 And my wife is trying to help him. So she tries to grab him. He kicks her right in the stomach. Boom! Ah! He's flipping out. And, and he's probably starting to go under, right? And so finally she's like, Marcel, stand up. And so he stands up. He's about that high in the water right there. <laughs> uh, you can't defy Archimedes' principle, right? Now, now, let me introduce another principle to you because this is something that is really, really important. And because it's not at the forefront, we, we often ignore it. But it's there. And because we don't suffer immediate consequences like defying Archimedes' principle and drowning on the spot if you can't swim, we often ignore it. But it's still there, and it runs like computer software in the background. You don't see it, but it just keeps on going. It keeps on running. And that's this. If you ignore it, you suffer consequences. But if you, if you do something about it, you can receive blessings from it. And that's this. People reap what they sow. People reap what they sow. Now, this principle just is, right? People reap what they sow. Now, let me just read something to you out of the book of Galatians because that's what the Lord tells us, and it's Galatians chapter number 6. So this is going to be our text for this morning. Galatians 6. How many people want to live a blessed life? The principle of sowing and reaping is something that God has set in motion, and then you can sow in such a way that you can be blessed, okay? Or you can reap the consequences of ignoring God's principle. And I don't, there's a lot of TV stuff that goes on the TV with preachers, and, and I don't want to see anybody else duped and sending their Social Security and, and all this nonsense. And if you send something, I promise if you send something out here right now, you're going to get a blessing. That's gonna, I'm telling you. The only way to get out of debt is to pay the people you owe. Right? You can't, give, you can't give some money to somebody on the other side of the world and come up out of debt. Are you crazy? You know what I mean? Are you, I mean, that, it, you, the only way is to pay those people, right? You got to pay them their money, right? The Lord told me to put a check in the mail. My friend was over at uh, uh, Oklahoma. What's that school in Oklahoma? Um, ORU, yeah, she said, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the churches in the area had to stop taking checks from the students because they were putting stuff on there, $3,000, and in the memo, money cometh, or by faith. So they're writing checks by faith, bouncing them all over uh, Oklahoma. The only way to be blessed is, is to sow your way into a blessing, all right? So, so, so let's read what Jesus has to say, because that's a hard word to swallow, but, but if we apply it, <laughs> amen. Can I get an amen? amen. All right, because if you guys start throwing stuff, I will duck behind this little fortress I've got. Brethren, verse 1, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now there's a lot in there, but we don't have time for it. All right. Be not deceived, verse 7, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It should say reapeth. But, but, but for he that soweth in his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You know, while we were talking, I felt like the Lord wanted me to just talk about uh, real fast an illustration just on, on relationships. And that's right here, verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap of the flesh corruption, 
but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Do you remember last, was it last year we were talking about, uh, my wife and I came up here, we were talking about the B-E-S-T, the best, right? You remember when I, we said something about the law of attraction? We said you can attract to yourself somebody who is good and then somebody who is not so good, right? It, this right here is so powerful when it comes to that. For, for, for those who, who would say, you know what, I'm willing to, to uh, have delayed gratification. Do you not know that is sowing a seed in your own life that will cause you to reap a man or a woman of God one day, right? Or you could, you could sow to, 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 to the flesh and reap corruption, right? We don't need to get too much into that. But I just want to challenge you, and I, and I want to also come right here to verse 9 because he says, listen, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season, every woman ought to say amen. For in due season, you shall reap a good husband. Oh, excuse me, hang on. You shall, oh, you shall reap if you faint not. It, all the ladies are like, amen. 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 Right? I'm telling you, if you hold on for God's best, you'll not settle for somebody who is just good. Don't settle for good when you can have God's best. Patience. Patience. All right, that was just a side note. I just had to put that out there. Listen to what the message says real quick. Verse 6 in the Message Bible says, Be very sure now, you who have been trained to be a self-sufficient uh, to, to, to a self-sufficient maturity, that you went to into a generous common life with those who have trained you, sharing all the good things that you have in experience. Verse 7 through 8 says this, Don't be misled. No one makes a fool of God. What a person plants, he will harvest. The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. And he'll have to show for his life its weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth in him, has harvests a crop of real life, eternal life. So let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. At the right time, we will reap a harvest good crop if we don't give up or quit. Right now, therefore, every time we get the chance... Let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. Now, he's, when he's talking about sowing and reaping, he's talking about a principle of this is, has to do with farming, right? So you see out here all the corn that grows, and they're about to take it down now because the harvest is, is already come, and it's just about over. But you sow seed into the ground, and you leave it there for some time. And it takes patience, right? It takes patience to see any kind of a profit. You can't throw a seed in the ground and be like, be out there checking it the next day and you're down there looking there. Okay, I think I see a sprout. I see a sprout. All right, time to pluck it, right? It's like getting a check and spending the whole thing. Now we're broke. You know what I mean? So, so what he's talking about, he's talking about the principles of life that it takes time to see fruits, especially in youth ministry. If anybody is a leader in youth ministry, when it comes to the lives of young people and older people, fruit takes time. And we have to be patient enough to have the love and the care that we're still, I, I feel like I'm still moving the same block with this young person. Well, it takes time. Not everybody is on the same time frame. Other people Sometime, I, I, one time I had the pastor tell me, but they were smoking in the parking lot. I was like, Pastor, man, praise God. What? Well, that kid was on, I mean, he was on some hard drugs six months ago. You know what I mean? I'm glad he's just smoking a cigarette. And then after that cigarette's done, then we can get him, maybe we can get him saved to, to where he's not smoking anything at all and he's come to know the Christ. And then maybe after that, we, we can work on him and, and get him baptized in water. And then, and then by God's grace, maybe we can now begin to disciple him a little bit. But it, it might take time. I remember my, uh, my pastor, he was asking me, so, you know, how long do you think that it's going to take to really get a, I said, about five years. Take about five years to get this youth ministry where it needs to be right? 
not going to come in there and throw one concert and throw a bunch of money out. Now, all of a sudden, wow, we have this thriving ministry that every young person's getting discipled, and it, it takes time, right? And the same thing, same principle happens in life. It takes time to see fruit. We have to invest in others. We have to invest in ourselves. The way I came to this place to be able to preach, I put in work. I posted one on Instagram from, uh, it's a thing called the Classy People, and he said it was like a Lamborghini was out there in front of a mansion, and he said, my secret to success is simple. And on the bottom it said, I put in work. <laughs> right? Somebody say, put in work. Hard work pays the bills, right? That's the old saying. So we have to put in work because the Lord said, listen, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow is what you're also going to reap. It's like exercising. Oh, Lord, I better not. I, let me, you know what? Never mind. Forget that one. I won't even get on that. They're like, oh, here we go now. Now he's going to stretch out an amen on me, and he's going to make me say amen, and I don't even believe it. Amen. 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 New Year's is rolling around. Uh, let me get a witness. Right? We have Pastor, uh, Pastor Ray from our old church. He said, uh, yeah, I, um, I get the urge to exercise, and I go lay on the couch until it's gone, and then it just leaves me. <laughs> but you know what? Sometimes we can sow in our lives in such a way, and, and the results of our lives look something like this. Maybe not every area of our lives, but there's those deleted pictures that we have that we don't want anybody to see, right? And so those are the consequences of ignoring the principles of sowing and reaping. We have sown to the flesh, and now we are reaping the seeds of the flesh, right? The works of the flesh. And that is a principle that is just there. Now, if we close right now and pray, we'd all leave here depressed and everybody would be like, man, it was great, but my goodness, that was a heavy word. What's wrong with that man down? But anyway, we're not going to do that because the Scripture doesn't leave it like that. It, it's, it's almost like a two-sided coin. He says, listen, you can sow your life in such a way that you can reap destruction, but the same principle still exists that you can also sow good seed into a ground and you can see a harvest in your life. And so another good thing is that, is that I know that I can sow good seed and it is guaranteed that I will be blessed because it's something that God has set in motion. And so if I want to live a blessed life, I apply the principles of the scriptures into my life and we are guaranteed success every time according to what the word says. Right? It's just like Archimedes' principle. You throw it into the water, it's going to sink. You put, the, you put the ship into the water, it will float. And if we take what God has said in his word and apply it to our lives, everything that we create will float every single time. It is a guaranteed blessing. But there are no miracle grow products in God's kingdom. You have to sow it, and it has to be watered, and it has to be tilled and you have to come out and you have to invest time and 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 I got my buddy back there Schmitty he knows what I'm talking about this man will will plant and he will water but he knows that if he does that he's guaranteed to have a, a harvest and a blessing and that's where money comes from right right so 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 that's where the blessing comes from here's another thing though and sometimes we find ourselves in this because everybody has deleted pictures in their life everybody's got some deleted pictures in their life. I've got some deleted ones in my, in my own, and I know you do too. But, but what's so good about that is though maybe we have sown some bad seed in life and, and perhaps even walking in, in, in the consequences of it now, the scriptures are real clear that we can begin to sow now good seed, and with time we will see a harvest. Right? We can, in other words, we can sow our way out of that by applying God's principles in life right now. Listen, here's another scripture. Out of Joel 2 and 25 says this. He says, listen, God's able to, to restore the years that the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the locust has eaten. Right? He's able to restore them. That means God is able to do things supernaturally. So that even though 
you may be at a place where you have sown bad seed. God said, listen, I'm able to rebuild your life once again. All you have to do is sow good seed, and God said, I will rebuild these walls once again. I want you guys to go back and read the book of Nehemiah. That man rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. He still had challenges, but he rebuilt them. And God is in the business of rebuilding people's lives. And if you sow seeds, God will restore. You know what restore means? Restore means I lost some money, but, but now somehow God made a way, and now it is all coming back to me somehow. I don't know how. That's God's business, right? I just know that I'm going to apply his word to my life, and God is able to restore years that the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the locust have eaten. So in other words, for years I lost my cross, but God is able to restore that. He, God is just awesome. He is just incredible. God is able, he does stuff like bring water from rocks, you know, and, and, and rain down quail from heaven and, and, and manna. I mean, he is able to do things far exceedingly, abundantly, above more than we can ask, think, or even imagine. And listen, God is for you. Some of you need to hear that, I guess. God is for you and not against you. And if God be for you, then who can be against you? Right? And so God is able to restore the years the canker worm, the palm worm, and the locusts have eaten. But we can't ignore the principle of sowing and reaping. But if you sow, it is a guaranteed blessing if you sow according to the scriptures. I'm here to tell you that you are blessed. You are blessed. I said you are blessed. Always remember, according to what he just said, that we are blessed and we're blessed to be a blessing. And God is able to restore the years. Now, young people in this room, I've already spoken to, to those who are, who are uh, old school, and, and here are the new school, all right? Now, and, and all those in between, right? everybody who's still trying to say, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not old school, but, you know, you got old with the rest of us. All right, so listen. The greatest testimony is this that I never sowed the kind of seed that caused me to reap the destruction of the flesh. That's the greatest testimony that you could have. I never had sex before marriage, right? That's the greatest testimony. I never got into drugs. That's the greater testimony that you could say, you could, you could stand before your husband or, or, or your wife when you get married, right? That you could say, I never had anybody before you. I saved myself for you. That is the greatest testimony. So I want to encourage you that, that sow good seed now. It's like investing. If, if a young person would just invest a little bit of money, by the time they got to retire, they'd have a whole lot. And if you apply God's word in your life now, you will reap a blessed life. It is guaranteed every single time. But for those of us who have not sown that God is able to restore the years that the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the locusts have eaten. Man, I hope you guys have been blessed this weekend. Well, why don't we, uh, how much time do we actually have? It's about time to pray, right? See, nobody ever gives me any sign, no nothing. That's okay. That's all right. All right, hey, why don't we have a round of applause for the, what the Lord has done this weekend? Well, let's pray, everybody. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, Lord. We thank you for the words that you have spoken. Lord, um, I, I give you thanks, Lord, because you have, you, you've allowed me to preach your word. And, Lord, anybody who ever comes before us and preaches, it's if, if you're not preaching through them, Lord, then it's worthless. But we give you thanks, Lord, for your presence being here, for speaking your word directly into our spirit, Lord. We thank you for every catalyst in this room. Lord, we thank you that you have called us for something far greater than ourselves, and we depend on you, Lord, daily. We ask, Lord, that you would fill us fresh with your spirit, that when we leave here, 
that we would not be the same ever again. When we go back to our communities, you would have us to go back in, with a vision. Lord, uh, when we go back into to environments where there are unsaved people and maybe even unsaved loved ones, Lord, that your spirit would go before us. You would lead us. You would guide us. And I pray, Father, for your protection and safety upon each and every person in this room, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for us. And it's only in you and you alone that we have life. And I thank you, Lord, that we're also able to have an abundant life. And I pray, Father, that we would begin to sow seed so that, Lord, in time, we would see and reap a blessed life. And we would be able to teach those principles to the younger generation as well. Father, I specifically want to pray for leaders, Lord. I pray for, uh, for, for the student leaders, Father, that there would be uh, an honoring of those who are above them and who have gone before them. We pray for a culture of honor in our churches and in our homes, Lord, in Jesus' name, and appreciation for the generation that has gone before them. And, Father, we pray, we pray Lord, for the vision of, of, of those who are in leadership now, Lord, the older generation. Father, that they would have the grace and the patience and the vision to develop the next generation. We thank you, Lord, that you said upon this rock you will build your church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so, Lord, we thank you for the ongoing work in our lives, and we thank you for the ongoing work in our churches. And, Lord, we're asking that each and every church here represented would truly be salt and light in their community. In Jesus' name. Father, for those who are in a hostile situation, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would give those streets back to Jesus. Back, Father, we pray that our churches would begin to flood with people who don't know you, and they would come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Lord, they would begin to be discipled, and they would go back out from the environment that they came. And Lord, we ask that our cities would be saved in the name of Jesus. And we give you thanks, Father. Help us to be the salt and light that you have called us to be. We honor you, and we thank you for this weekend. In Jesus' name, can you guys say amen? amen. Come on, let's lift up one more shout unto the Lord for what he's done this week. All right, everybody, another year. God has been faithful. God bless you guys. Safe travels. The Lord be with you. Amen.